Radio Live. Sunday Business with Andrew Patterson. You're with Sunday Business. Well, as we've already mentioned, the markets seem to have decided the bad news is just about all over and it's blue skies from here. At the risk of pouring cold water on the party, our next guest, though, isn't quite so sure. Sandia Das is the author of Traders, Guns and Money and an international banking consultant based in Sydney. And uh, he joins us now. Das, let's pick up from when we last spoke to you back in November. Clearly, the deleveraging you've spoken about previously continues. And I wonder where you believe we're now at in this market cycle. I think the deleveraging has two very distinctive components. The first is obviously in the financial sector, where we're seeing a two-part process. One is the losses are leading to the banks basically eating up their share capital and therefore they have to reduce their balance sheets and they've pretty much stopped lending. And the growth in their balance sheets has stopped, in fact, has gone into reversal. And that's feeding the second part of the deleveraging, which is in the real economy. And if 2007 and 2008 was about the financial part of this crisis, it's very definitely now moved from the from the end of 2008 to now into the real sector. So we're seeing growth collapse and we're seeing unemployment rise, investment collapse, all driven primarily by the fact that the supply of debt to the real economy to either grow or to fund consumption has ceased. Because essentially what is happening in this deleveraging process is the debt fuel consumption that's driven the world for the last 15, 20 years has slowed because the supply of debt has slowed. Oxygen's gone, so people are gasping for breath. And that's a continuing theme that we'll see through 2008, 2009, and probably some part of 2010. So what you're saying is that even though the banks uh, might want to lend in many cases, the, 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 the tier one capital situation that they currently have is almost uh, precluding them from doing so. That's exactly right. I think there's a shortage of capital of around about somewhere between one and three trillion dollars, depending on how you value the assets on the books of these banks. And that means that essentially the debt creation or the stock of debt in the world will have to come down by anywhere up to 30%. And that process is obviously choking off growth. And that's the process through which the system is really recalibrating itself to what is the sustainable level of debt the system can carry. So then the question has to be asked is, can anything be done to slow uh, or, or create a bottom for that process, or does it naturally have to continue uh, down this route until it finds its own uh, flaw? Well, I think fundamentally, I think that's the issue that people have to confront. My view for what it's worth, is that the process is natural because you can't force debt into a system beyond the capacity of the debt uh, to be repaid or to be carried. And I think what we are now seeing is a last-ditch effort by governments to try to actually keep the debt at a higher level than sustainable. And there's reasons for that. In Western liberal democracies, people don't get re-elected in recessions particularly bad recessions. So governments are very, very keen to see a resumption of growth. And to that end, they're doing something which is like essentially a strange form of cure, which is for an alcoholic, they're just starting to imbibe more alcohol. So what they're doing is a process by which they're substituting government debt for private sector debt. And things like the Geithner plan and things like the fiscal stimulus packages that have been launched around the world have essentially two dynamics. They're basically raising a lot of money and then they're basically pumping that into the system or trying to pump that into the system to replace the private sector debt that is diminishing. The problem with that is, number one, the governments have to finance that. And this year, the governments around the world will have to issue three to four trillion dollars of government debt. Now, of that, roughly two trillion is going to come from the United States. Now, to give some perspective to that, in 2007, the U.S. Treasury issued $460 billion. So they're being forced to issue around four and a half times that this year. And essentially, this makes it very, very vulnerable to not being able to raise this money and setting off a new phase in this crisis, which has actually led to this strange named phenomenon called quantitative easing, which is really printing money. And really, that's as simple as I've heard one commentator describe as, as a cut and paste in an Excel spreadsheet. 
That's very, very true. And I think the governments around the world are not willing to confront the reality. The reality is that they have enjoyed very high rates of growth in what is the world's largest Ponzi scheme, which is debt. And effectively, that now game now has ended because essentially that debt game has hit effectively a problem, which is everybody's realized that this debt can't be repaid. And so now they're struggling to try to bring the patient back to life or to some semblance of life because their political futures and their re-election prospects to some extent are tied up with it. And my view is that it's very, very difficult to bring that back. And my view is what the world has to confront which is the most difficult part of this crisis, is the growth trajectory that we've gotten used to, which is by IMF standards, a 4 to 6% global average growth rate, has to come down. And in the short run, it'll obviously be negative. But even when it recovers, it may well be a much, much lower growth rate. The trend rate might be, say, 0 to 3%, not 4 to 6%, which has extremely profound consequences for economies, for individual prospects, and governments. So what you're saying, effectively, uh, we've, we're running the engine too high at the moment and we're just going to have to get used to running a slower engine. That's exactly right. And that is not something that's very easy to accept. And it's not only in the West. For instance, if you take China, for example, China's major problem is it needs very, very high level of growth to absorb the number of people coming into the workforce every year. And if they can't do that, then obviously there are social issues which flow from that. And this present disruption in the global economy has huge social unrest issues. For instance, in China, 20 million plus people, which is the itinerant workers which came from the country to the urbanization or industrial factories, essentially are now out of work. There's 5.9 million people who are essentially coming out of university in China this year. Of them, the latest forecasts I've seen is about around half of them will find jobs. But the jobs they'll find are much lower paid with much poorer prospects. For instance, the People's uh, Liberation Army is being flooded with job application. So under those circumstances, the crisis actually, both in the West and in the emerging nations, has a social dimension which has to be managed, which is why you're seeing the governments around the world frantically trying to stave off what is, in my view, likely to be the end game here. So in terms of trying to solve one problem, we're effectively creating another and uh, quantitative easing is the conduit by which that is being done. What are the implications of that massive amount of stimulus that is now currently being applied to Western economy? Well, I think the whole idea of quantitative easing has to be taken in the context of what the governments are trying to do. And there's two elements to what they're trying to do. One is to pump money into the banks to recapitalize them, to get the banking system to function and credit to function more normally. The second is they are actually substituting demand. Through the fiscal stimulus packages which have been in place around the world, they're essentially creating government demand to substitute for consumer and corporate demand. Now, my view is that is driving the quantitative easing. And the quantitative easing is being driven by the fact they have to raise money. Now, in a historical sense, governments would have raised money by issuing debt. But the problem is there is limitations to how much they can issue, say, switching to quantitative easing, which is actually printing money. And there's a second reason for doing this. One of the things that people forget is governments have very limited policy tools. And one of the policy tools they have, which has inherent limitations, is monetary policy. And essentially, they have cut interest rates pretty close to zero in a lot of economies, not yet in Australia and New Zealand, but they've cut interest rates very savagely, which means you cannot cut any further, which means you have an effective problem of what policy tool to deploy. And what they're now doing is using quantitative easing as essentially the last line of, of resort, effectively, in terms of the tools they have. So they're pumping money in the hope of starting the economy. But fundamentally, I think this is not going to work. 